three weeks ago, we met live in person um, at the WeWork where um, my office is. And David here, who was on the chat, he was actually there. And so yeah. it's been a pretty crazy, surreal time for all of us here in New York and everywhere, everywhere in the world. So um, all our meetups for the foreseeable future in New York will be these virtual meetups. So thank you for attending. Um, so let's just do a quick round of intros. Uh, my name is Al, everyone. You've probably seen me if you've been to our New York City meetups. I'm a solutions architect at Coda, and I basically help people build their docs and come up with great solutions to solve problems for their teams. And I host these meetups that will hopefully be going on every month. And David? Hey, uh, my name is David Self. I uh, am a director of a product strategy for a company called Keat Health, which is a uh, patient engagement in analytics uh, platform uh, specifically for physical therapy patients and actually uh, met out when I was in uh, New York. I, I moved there for a hot minute uh, right after my uh, wedding about a month ago and then uh, have, have come back. So I'm coming to you live from Austin and I'm happy to be here and hopefully uh, have it be something enjoyable for all of us. Yeah. So David was in New York for like a hot minute, like you said, yeah. and uh, technically you're not in New York anymore, but I feel like uh, you are still like a New York New Yorker in my mind. So yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So today, uh, David has you heard his background, and I, I he had some really cool code docs that he wanted to share in terms of how he's been using it at Keat Health, his company. I'll let him kind of tell the backstory about Keat Health and um, the scenario and what he was trying to solve. Um, but yeah, I think just anything that people are doing, I mean, especially given the, the current crisis, like a bunch of people have been building CodaDocs um, to help uh, collaborate with in terms of like sharing resources, doing grocery deliveries, all kinds of things. And I thought David had a really interesting use case for how his own company has been dealing with uh, the COVID crisis. Uh, so yeah, we'll turn it over to, to David and have him present. And um, if you have any questions along the way, feel free to just chat in the uh, chat box. Oh, by the way, I, I should probably do a quick overview of how this works. So for those of you who have never used Crowdcast, it's um, kind of like a webinar software, not not too dissimilar from Zoom, except only David and I are on camera right now. But and after David presents, we'll, I'll ask some of you if you want to present anything. Um, but if you look in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see a little chat box. I noticed that Brendan, hey Brendan, what's up? He uh, just posted a chat. If, any, if you want to post anything in the chat, you can just start writing there. If you have a question that you want to ask, um, if you move over to the bottom of the screen, you'll see an ask a question link. Uh, it's right next to call to action, um, in between call to action and polls. So you can ask questions there and people can upload and download them. Um, so those questions, we all basically um, read them off on the screen to David or myself. And yeah, that's kind of how things will go for the meetup. Um, I guess before we, it looks like some more people have joined the meetup. Um, the people on, on the meetup, if you're in the meetup, do you want to just kind of say hello in the chat, say where you're calling in from? I'm guessing from New York. Uh, but if not, feel free to write something else. I'll just start off the chat. I'm calling in from NYC. I'm Code HQ, but I'm Al. Mm -hmm. Oh, Tennessee, nice. Another cool. Southerner. Nice. All right, cool. All right, so we're, everyone's getting used to using the chat. <laughs> Drew, <laughs> yes, being social distant. We're all being social distant right now, indeed. Uh, cool. Well, hope, hopefully everyone's doing all right. And uh, yeah, feel free to ask questions and use the chat as um, as you wish. Uh, so David, I'll turn it over to you and I'll let you start presenting. Great. Uh, well, thanks for having me, Al. And uh, hope, hopefully this is uh, an inspiring uh, use case of, of how we use Coda. So I, I give a, like a, a 30 second microwave background of um, Keat because it's, it's relevant to why we would um, do something for um, COVID. And uh, I have a, a single graphic here that typically is, uh, I think will be helpful for at least this audience to get a general idea, which uh, as you can essentially just see by this uh, screenshot of the app, uh, we, we basically are, we sell to physical therapy practices and specifically what we do is to help them engage their patients beyond 
the walls of an in-person visit, um, which is no different than any other uh, industry or consumer industry these days. Uh, it's getting more and more critical to engage people uh, beyond just when they when they show up because they expect 24-7 access, just like we all do from uh, Amazon and um, Netflix and et cetera. And so one of the consequences of that for our company was that our, um, our practices our, our, our customers were not actually considered, um, for most places, essential businesses. And so one, if they're in shelters in place, they, they had to, to shut their doors. Or secondly, you may imagine if you have some, say, uh, chronic neck pain or some knee pain that's been bothering you, uh, many people probably aren't going to risk going to a, say, hospital-affiliated PT clinic or even a standalone one because uh, they can deal with their issues and, uh, and, and be a little, uh, you know, push it off a little bit more because they don't want to be around uh, a huge amount of people. And so uh, they've, they've been pretty hit pretty hard with, uh, with their revenue because they generate that by in-person visits. And, and so consequently, what we wanted to try to uh, offer was uh, uh, we, don't, we don't have any type of a freemium or free trial uh, version of Keat for a variety of reasons, most of which is uh, healthcare is pretty laborious to just get somebody to sign up because of the, uh, the due diligence you have to go through from a tech standpoint and a security standpoint. But what we wanted to try to offer is, is figure out some way to help our clients do some type of telehealth or some type of engagement with their clients with really, uh, you know, no intention of that from a revenue generation, but, you know, really just to kind of do the right thing and to try to serve, help our clients serve their patients that all of a sudden were rehabbing from their knee injury and now they, they can't go in. And so they're not sure what they're supposed to do. And so uh, as, a, as a kind of cool story, and I think this is really relevant um, for, for like kind of the average um, Coda user is that, you know, sometimes you see these like pristine, uh, perfect, you know, templates and kind of get this idea that that's how it works in the, in the real world. And at least the reality for us is we have a, a couple super users and I don't really even specifically mean with Coda. I just mean with maybe the thought equity of, of certain ways of moving work forward. And, uh, and so I think it's kind of a cool story to talk about how this developed because we, we essentially turned around this product in a, a, quite literally a 12 to 24 hours. And it was really the definition of cross-functional. We had sales, operations, product, and not just our, our company, but we have a parent company that was also um, involved. So how I was going to go about this is I'm going to show how the initial idea happened and then how that initially turned into like a really rough coda doc and then it kind of exploded into a, a center of gravity for the entire 200 uh, uh, person company all in about all in about two days hey david do you want to quickly walk through how you um have been traditionally using coda before all yeah this first yeah sure so um despite despite my uh, uh title I, I primarily these days i'm on the revenue side of the business so i, I run our um our sales team, specifically our enterprise sales team. And, and uh, Coda has been used sparingly by non-sales uh, non individuals, but primarily it's been on the uh, enterprise sales team to really do two things. One, manage internal projects, um, say like new, uh, new, new hire onboarding, for instance. And then the second one has been uh, to actually manage as have a center of gravity for managing enterprise sales deals, which if you may imagine when you're selling to a hospital, there's a lot of people involved from a lot of different organizations, both internally and externally. So that is primarily how we've been using it at this point with not a huge amount of cross-functional collaboration. We've dabbled a little bit um, here and there, but they're primarily on their own individual systems, products on you know, Confluence and Pivotal and Operations was using Rike, and then we're all, you know, sparingly using the a la carte Google Doc or Excel sheet or um, or Word Doc. So that was kind of the status quo up to this point. Cool. Thanks. Sure. So I'm going to go ahead and share my, uh, oops, sorry, I hit the wrong button there. So uh, to kind of tell a story of how this developed was, this came through on the night of March 15th um, from our president, who was up kind of really all night thinking, how can we do something to help our clients? And you can see it's got kind of the skeleton of a, of a Coda doc, but that's about it, right? Where there was some basic overview, of how we're going to handle it with sales implementation and a task list. So just for my sake, I initially took that and put it into my own little, uh, little Coda doc. And 
what that ended up turning into was an entire cross-functional doc, which you can see here. And, and so what I'm gonna show, what you're seeing here is actually the end product because this ended up being, it turned into the end state of it was it was essentially temporary for three days for cross-functional access. And then it turned into a sales specific uh, enablement wiki to explain to the sales team what we were doing and how to handle the orders. So how we did that is what you're seeing here, all the stuff that's open uh, was that we used the publishing feature of Coda. And so the sales team only sees the published one. And then all these were the internal things that we did to develop the product launch, uh, uh, which are hidden. So um, here's how it all started. How it initially started was uh, I we took the little, the little voting thing and just figured out, hey, uh, what's the name of it? As you can see, there wasn't a lot of uh, participation. So uh, majority win, and we just ended up calling it um, you know, Keep COVID. And then I took the task from this loose, loose leaf thing and made it, uh, we made it a little bit more actionable. So we kind of have developed an internal uh, action item template, if you will, to kind of use in every, every doc that, um, that we use. I found one of the challenges with uh, getting some adoption is even just having like some basic templates like this and demonstrating why, how it's more efficient than say a, Excel sheet or a Reich. So we, we had this template that I had used for enterprise deals already. And so as you can see, all I, literally all we did was we, we pasted this and then we added some basic um, status monitoring and, and buttons and assignments so that you know there could be some transparency. What you will notice is the assignee, you can see that even though this was the, uh, the people column, uh, that happened after the fact once it got totally to the revenue team because like i mentioned um for many of these folks they had never used coda before um or what makes our situation even more unique is that um, we are a subsidiary of a larger company the larger company is on office 365 and keep the subsidiaries on g suite so we, we wanted we wanted to have something where they could at least visualize the state of action items given that they couldn't interact with them. And so we couldn't just use the assignee column because it would only pull from uh, people in our, our Gmail database. And it, it actually worked perfectly like it, for having just an artifact of state, it was great. So that's why you see that this turned into some of the assignees, but initially was just a select list column. And it's color coded by department and you can see, so it was a basic action item thing with a couple interactive filters so that if um, you know if you were in success or you were in marketing, then you could just filter by that particular interactive um, uh, filter. And I suppose you know ideally that would be nice to have its own section, you know, its own different view, view of marketing, view of client success, view of sales. But we you know we had a charter to to launch it in 24 hours, so I think it's kind of important to realize it doesn't always have to be. It can be a little messy and a little simplistic sometimes just to get things out the door and it worked really well for us at the time. Then the second challenge uh, that we had was, okay, we have all these people that, that haven't initially um, used Coda or they're just trying to focus on their particular task. And we had this you know, Slack channel, but as everyone knows, those, those things can get pretty busy, particularly if you don't have great Slack hygiene with uh, how people behave in them. And so, one of the problems that we were trying to solve was how do we how do we get questions answered um, but keep them in this center of gravity instead of just throwing them out into the kind of abyss of slack and and then hoping somebody um, saw them or if someone wanted to look to see where the status of where we were at that they could easily find the answer where the status was without seeing you know digging into a slack thread so this was actually probably the most uh, important thing we used in the very beginning was we, we, we made this, um, this basic section where we would just paste in the, um, in the Slack channel, uh, kind of like a regular reminder, reminder to please go to the outstanding questions item. And if you are, if you're assigned to the question, um, please just click, we, we use the button here to say, hey, hey, click to answer this question and then mark it, uh, and then mark it as answered. And that was a way where uh, people really, they didn't necessarily have to interact with the entire doc. We could just tell them exactly where to go, even if they had no idea what, um, what Coda was for, for some of them. 
but it allowed us to keep things organized. So they would click this and then we kind of organized this to, to be really, really simple and straightforward where they would just come in here and type their answer. And we actually use uh, Loom, we took these out, but we had a couple of Loom videos in here to show how to do this. They'd, uh, they'd mark as answered. And then how uh, our team, the team that was kind of managing this project, then we would go down here to view the, uh, we took a detail view to view the answers. And uh, so, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't uh, uh, kill this column because if we took the column here and we had the answer, you know, it would get this like huge table. And, uh, and so that, that wouldn't be very helpful. Or maybe we're just uh, kind of like pretentious on that, but we just want our table to look nice. So. No, I, I'm the same way. I like to keep my tables nice and tidy. Yeah, yeah. And a, a side note, I found that that's a, a very a little useful thing to, to use because one, it, it, it's a better way of working. And two, um, it's kind of just an obvious way to see how some, a coded table can be superior to a spreadsheet sometimes, uh, which is something that everyone's probably dealt with. And if you can have that as their first experience, uh, we found that that kind of helps people get it, so to speak. So this all kind of happened linear. And then, so when these things got, got, um, got answered, um, then we would go to the action item and, and mark it done. So once, uh, once all of the, the, the cross-functional stuff got, uh, uh happened, the, the last thing to do was to get specific on, um, what was actually, uh, in the product of the free version versus what was in our standard version. And if you recall from this Google doc, it was kind of pretty loose leaf in here as to what, what was in here. And so what happened is um, when this first got launched in the Slack channel, you get a lot of cross-functional questions of, okay, I just wanna be clear what's it, so what's part of this and what's not part of this. And, um, and so we made kind of, again, just like a, a basic, very simple table um, demonstrating what it was because we knew not only could we ask people to confirm that this was the case, so we make an action item for engineering and for uh, our president to make sure we were all on the same page. But then we knew we could easily resurface this table for the sales team to have like a very simple artifact to what exactly this was. And I'll show you in a second, we actually resurfaced this as a published web page, this exact table for clients when we did our outbound prospecting template, just telling people about the, um, the free offer. So this this table looks great. I can totally see like okay, what do we want to offer for um, Keith COVID nineteen and then the Keith standard. Um, but like, I'm sure there is a lot. There was probably a lot more happening behind the scenes on Slack and what have you. Yeah, to yeah. Come to consensus on what features you can offer from the product. So I'm curious how that came about. Was it like just a bunch of people on Slack? Were there like the Zoom meetings happening? Yeah. Um, so or? so it was um, it was primarily driven by. Uh, by, by our general manager, um, which, which was nice because Keyed isn't that complex of a, of a product. So it's, it's, it's pretty easy to, to say what we could do and what we wouldn't. And, and most of it was more, more of a business, you know, um, decision, like could, this is a good example. Um, we, we couldn't afford to, to, to do EMR integrations for, for all these customers as much as we we would love to. Most of that did happen uh, just in, a, in, in like a Slack channel and in siloed conversations and phone calls and stuff like that. Um, the basic charter that, that I gave the team uh, was, hey, I don't, we don't necessarily need to be in, in all those, but uh, we need to know what they are and then, and then it will reflect it um, into Coda. So that create, uh, iterative process did not happen um, in the doc. We just captured the state of where that process was uh, in the doc. And what is EMR again? EMR is an electronic medical record. Oh, so, I see. Yeah, yeah. Um, and man, we wish it was as simple as a single sign-on with uh, with Google, but uh, it, it's it's definitely not. So yeah, it's all different. Other whole whole other beast in terms of healthcare records and stuff. So yeah, yeah, that's right. Yep. Very Did cool. I answer your question now? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um. So, uh, so then, so, so, so we got that part done. And so now we kind of basically had 
what what keep um, COVID was, and we had mo all of the cross-functional action items done. So um, like operations and support, um, you know, they obviously had to come up with how they were going to implement these folks, uh, how they were going to support them, that type of thing. And again, that didn't happen in um, in code. It actually happened primarily in um, in Reich. But I just worked with Amanda and our team, you know, with a quick turnaround to make sure that I could just, you know, ask, hey, we got a couple basic items on this um, on, on our table here. Uh, that's very very general, right? So in reality, this you know determined support model for these clients was in reality, if it was its own table, probably was you know, 15 rows, but that was managed in a, in another forum. But uh, again, this was like the center of gravity where we could at least say, Hey, here's the state of, um, of where this is. So we know when we can move forward and start training, um, the sales team and ready to go live with it. And of course, hopefully demonstrated that you know, this model was superior, but we'll see. Um, so we got, we got all of the, uh, action items done. And so then at that point, um, it was, how are we going to now train a distributed sales team of close to 20 people? What in the heck this um, free version was that um, that we were doing? And as some context, our um, our sales team um, it sells, sells two um, products. So we're owned by a parent company, again, called Clinician, and they sell the Clinician product, which is an electronic medical record. And then they also sell um, sell keep, and so uh, it's it's not the easiest job to to sell uh, one really complex product and then and then also sell um, you know an add on that has some of its own complexity. So we have to be like super super clear when we're doing enablement so that it, you know they can be successful and and not get um, overwhelmed. Is this um was this 20 distributed sales folks for clinician or for just key? The, the, the clinician, uh, the sales team is centralized. So, um, so kind of, there is no such thing as like a key sales team and a clinician sales team. There's just an overall clinician sales team that sells uh key, uh, and also sells a clinician's product. I see. So, so in addition, important. in addition to the portfolio of clinician products, now it's like within just key, there's like a specific COVID. Right here so to speak. yeah right yeah you got it you got it and the other part which makes this fun is all of the um all of the sales team uh um because they're not technically part of the uh, subsidiary that is keat but they sell keat they are on uh microsoft suite office 365. um so i've had i've given some of the sales team uh keep gmail addresses so they can access our coda database but haven't hadn't given all of it all of it to them because again you got to make it clear why we're doing this because I did it one time kind of all a cart and then the question was so when do I use my key email versus my clinician email and thought okay gosh I I can't I can't open that can of worms so I got to make sure people understand that you're just using this email to access things like Coda that doesn't support uh, Microsoft at the time right? mm. which is a nice queue up for you later Al when you when you show that you know you can sign up without with with any email now. Um, well, you can sign up with any email now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's where the publish doc feature was an absolute positively lifesaver so that um, that they could still interact with the doc despite not having um, access at the time. And we just couldn't reasonably turn around and onboard people distributed to, um, to have a bunch of Gmail accounts because we'd get too many questions about what it was for and have to give people password, you know, all that sort of stuff. So. What we now did is we took this basic skeleton and then we turned it into a, a sales enablement wiki so that we could very, very quickly give a center of gravity to the to the um, sales team. Not to mention we had a couple new hires that were onboarding. <laughs> so uh, we had to just make sure it was really, really straightforward. So what we did is we actually resurfaced a lot of the outstanding questions um into a um an faq and this drop down thing was really really great because it allowed us to do it in one section and and not have it be um be too crazy and so this is just basic basic drop downs of the you can see these type of obvious answers we put a couple um tables in here that when they built the called an opportunity in salesforce uh how how are they going to mechanize this you know what were they going to put in amount what were they going to put in product and so 
it was really nice to be able to put a table in, in addition to free text in kind of an FAQ format. So I won't go through, uh, you know, go, go through all these, but this happened very cross-functionally when something would come up. I, we would just ask, ask someone, hey, just put that in the FAQ and then we'll sanitize it at the very end and make it look really pretty. This is kind of like a more, because I'm curious, like how would you define a key COVID lead? Is that someone who's like just interested in this pared down version of the product? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, there was a couple ways, um, and I'll get to this when I get to the lead flow. Uh, the, easy, the easier way is we kind of had a specific um, lead uh, capture uh, process for that. So we could, so 90% of people that came through, they specifically said they were interested in key COVID. So we could know that they knew that. Um, we announced it in a webinar and then in an email to all of our clients, uh, not to all of our clients, to all the people in the clinicians database. So, uh, and then we tried to do in that lead uh, kind of process. So we also use uh, Drift, which is a, a marketing chatbot on our site to do our best to make sure that we could capture the intent before it actually hit the sales rep so they wouldn't have to do the qualification themselves about, hey, are you looking into general or into the free version of key COVID? Gotcha, cool. So um, so part of that was then, uh, what, is the, what is the actual lead flow? So how are we going to handle the lead flow? And actually where that started was here. Um, so you'll notice that this was actually where we try to try to figure it out ourselves, but then we made a specific one for refs that didn't have a bunch of information that they needed. So what we ended up doing was because we had to move it around so fast, um, and we weren't sure of the volume that we would get, um, we actually decided to trade off having it perfectly synced within, um, within Salesforce, because although we have a, a lot of great best of breed tools that we can pretty easily kind of integrate with Salesforce. Salesforce isn't the, um, the simplest to just like pop up a Zapier integration. So we're, we're, we're pretty good at, at getting things out, but, um, but some of the ways that we wanted to just get, get it to market really quickly, um, we needed to work it on the, on the Keat side. And so we, we had to just try to do it as, as quick as possible. And that probably doesn't make a lot of sense, but uh, just, just, just trust me on it. Um, <laughs> um, so what we did is we made a we made a type form um, that you can see here. That was a, a, a basic type of uh, you know it was just a basic lead form asking people if they were um, if they were interested. And uh, and the reason that we 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 uh, we did that is long story short when that kind of that outbound email came out to the database or to prospects. Um, Keats still a relatively small subsidiary in the bottom line for a variety of reasons. We can't move that fast on, on making website um, changes. So in order to move really fast, we, we tried to figure out, well, what can we just point to point people to uh, in this email? Because the the lead form on our site was connected to uh, to Marketo, and we actually didn't want to have to go through that. We wanted to make it more lighter weight, so we made a separate lead form to to act as our our lead capture uh, page initially. And then once they once they did that, uh, we zapped it over to a, a Google Sheet, and then from the Google Sheet, we zapped it over to a Coda section which was just a actual, a second zap. So we zapped from Google to Coda. And the reason that we did that initially, you may be wondering why didn't you just go from the type form into the Coda leads, was because the, um, the sales development representative who was gonna be handling these leads, um, he, he didn't have a, he had never used Coda before and he didn't have a Gmail address. So we wanted to have a backup plan that in case it got overwhelming. We could just tell them to look at a Google sheet. Turned out uh, it wasn't overwhelming at all. And he never, never used this. So we, that, that was really great. But that's why we did this kind of boom, boom, boom. Cool. Then once you got a new row in the, uh, in the lead, in the live feed of leads, that then sent um, a Slack alert to, um, to a specific channel in um, a Slack that went to this specific SDR. And then what the SDR did is he would go to the, uh, 
uh, leads. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen one second, Al, because I just want to make sure that I've hidden uh, all of the actual leads information. Yeah, sure. Because I did this beforehand. Yeah, OK. So So when these came in, you can see uh, this pulled directly from the um, directly from the type form. And and what we and what we did was when they came in, you know, they would stay uh, a cur a obvious color. So the uh, the sales development representative who's like fresh out of college. So, you know, he's we wanted to make sure that it was really, really simple for him to understand was he'd get this lead. He would then go through here and see a couple of pieces of qualification criteria. And all of that stuff exists um, here, which specifically is number of therapists and location. But uh, we thought it would just be simpler if we could coach them to click a button than to look at a row. So we put this view details button in here and we use the uh, activate row formula. And then this would pop up the row and he could quickly see the number of therapists and we could have done a better job at the uh, at the address or make it more structured in the form. Then he had kind of his own cheat sheet internally as to what rep that would get assigned to. He would then assign it to um, the rep. He would then uh, copy the email address. He'd go to Slack. We use this awesome Slack bot called Troops, which pulls from Salesforce. So he would go backslash Troops, pop in the email. It would pull up the lead. He would update the, the lead source to be key COVID, which would actually feed into um, Salesforce. And then he would post that to the, to the rep in Slack. He'd send that to them uh, in Slack. Then what we'd have to do is then the rep would send out, we made two templates. So we made an inbound template for reps to use. So once they, once they got a lead, they could just use this template. They could personalize it, you know, if they knew, if they knew the person, if they didn't, they could use this template. They would then, um, when, when that email went out, then that same development representative that handed it off, he would go through here and he would just click contacted. And then this would change up here so that we could know uh, how quickly we were able to contact our leads and, you know, just make sure that we were staying on top of stuff. So the sales rep, would they, is, is he or she the one that's clicking on the contacted column? Or no, is that th this was the, uh, the sales development representative, which is called the oh, okay. SDR. Yeah. And, yep. and for those that aren't in, in sales, that's a position that is exclusively designed for uh, lead generation and outbound outbound kind of prospecting. So their, their, their primary role is to set meetings for the actual uh, reps or account executives. And again, because he was the only one with the Gmail address, uh, we didn't want to have to make coach reps how to sign up for Coda and, and stuff like that in such a short time frame. So we just did it a little bit more manual than we'd probably want to if we were going to really scale this thing out and just have him mark it as contacted. Gotcha. So then uh, once they did that, we had an inbound template again that they would use. And uh, kind of back to your uh, point, Al, the other part of this was, again, we want to make sure it's crystal clear so that we were not giving clients any false information about kind of, you know, what they were getting and what they weren't. And so um, we did a little PS at the bottom and this, we just took the table and um, Taylor on our team just made this basically just a, a, a very simple landing page of that same exact table. And again, it could be contextualized a lot better. You know, it could link back to the, to the sign up. Uh, uh, it could link to the contract or something like that. But we were moving so fast. We literally did all this in like 18 hours. Um, so it, it was just, it was way quicker than, than making a change to the site. And frankly, it was better then the landing page that got ended up being created because what we ended up creating was okay, but this is a little bit, even this is a little bit harder to read to understand the difference than, than seeing a, um, you know, a table like this. So there was a, you published this as a, as a published doc. Right? Yeah. Was, yeah. Okay. Right. Yep. yep. And then, and then we linked it in an outbound uh, a template that the, that the reps could use so that, the prospect was clear as to what they were signing up for. And uh, the other thing that we did uh, was usually in healthcare, you don't have any type of like self-service sign up like you would for say 
Coda because of the diligence and stuff, but um, we actually did. So we 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 had a self service sign up through um, DocuSign that our our team pulled together pretty fast. A little rough around the edges, but it, it worked. And so uh, that was actually the first time ever in the history of um, of clinicians that people could you know kind of just you know sign up on their own if they're ready to move forward. So that was pretty cool. Wow. And then um and then uh, once that would happen then that would again go into a Slack channel. It would hand off to the, um, to the client support team. And then that would fire off an automated uh, implementation into the, the key COVID version. And the same exact thing uh, for the outbound template. So this means that a rep maybe had someone in mind or they knew some people that they'd like to share the offer to maybe a, maybe a prospect that they were working with. And, you know, they're obviously not going to, most of them aren't going to be writing a big check to, to buy um, Keat or maybe they're looking at clinician, but they just want to be able to, to help them out. Or maybe it was an old client that switched to a competitor or something, but they had a good relationship. So we just made an outbound template that, that we just put, hey, personalize it here. But then it was kind of the exact same exact same thing. And the first one just just reoriented a little bit. And then the the last thing to tidy this all up was to contextualize it. So at the time, this was all pretty, uh, these sections were all over the place. So we made a little uh, read me first. We, uh, we put a cover photo on it and then we told him a goal and we tried to spell out, hey, you're gonna do this exact stepwise faction, uh, fashion when you go in here. Um, and then you can ask questions uh, in, the, in, in, you know, in your meetings and Slack channels. And then, uh, and then what happened was clinician support actually would get calls from clinician users that they heard about the offer. And so then um, Cindy on our team said, hey, can we, can we just briefly change this up a little bit? And so we made a section for clinician support that uh, at the end of the day was just a template. So we made them a template that they could just send to uh, people. This was the type form. And that was it, you know, and then once that type form came through, everything would go back through the normal process that we um, that we set up. And I'm, I'm guessing the support team, they're the they're the team that's kind of responding to people that have like tickets or emails about clinician products. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and where a lot of this came from, Al, was, um, you know, clinician, uh, you know, they would do they, we, we were doing daily town halls for. Um, for our clients every day to help them navigate, you know, whether it's small business loans or how to how to get reimbursed for telehealth or stuff like that. And so they would maybe hear about um, how how they could use Keep to help. And and so, but they were a clinician user and they maybe they they weren't that familiar with Keep. So they would they would actually call into their you know clinician account manager or support asking about it. So it, we weren't able, it was kind of coming in from like multi channels. So we wanted to make sure that we could coach that team how to get them into the same process that we had developed so we could scale it pretty quickly. Gotcha. Cool. So that's really it, man. And the other, the, the only other thing I'll say is what was uh, kind of cool was once we went through this, we had a lot more people kind of get exposed to this type of model of, of moving work forward, you know, in, in this case specific with Coda. And, um, and so, this type of same framework, we uh, our team totally rebuilt our onboarding for sales hires and um, did the same type of model. And we've gotten kind of really raving feedback from the new hires and some of the the OGs at uh, clinician about um, how how much it's been improved. So that was another pretty cool byproduct of this eighteen hour sprint and uh, and launching a product because it's starting to pay dividends in terms of creativity and trying to apply some of the simplicity and, and transparency to other parts of the organization. Wow. That's awesome. The, um, I think whenever you're rolling out a new process or tool, I mean, within like 18, 24 hours is already like a pretty amazing feat. Did you, were you kind of like, you have your role, like as you know, working in a sales yeah. team, but when you rolled this out, were you kind of the main point of contact for people that had questions about the, the process and the, the tool um yeah. I'm sure a lot of people were like what am i looking at and then they're basically stuck with like finding someone that knows what this code doc is all about yeah yeah so um most of the um 
most of that happened. So, so when it came to like how we're going to operationalize it from like a support and implementation side, we kind of let, let them, you know, just, I, I don't want to say let it be their problem, but we trusted them. You know, we, we trusted that once we got to someone signing up that, that they, that that would be transparency within that, within that department. And, and it wasn't necessarily critical from a cross-functional standpoint to understand exactly how people were going to get uh, implemented. Um, the the rest of it, like what what specifically we were doing from a product standpoint, and then how we were going to operationalize um, this to the to the to the marketplace. Yes, I was the main point of contact uh, uh, for for that. Uh, me and a colleague of mine, um, Taylor. And it was it was pretty obvious, right? Because I'm kind of like the the Koto champion, if you will, uh, at the company, and I'm a little unique in that. I have probably the most cross-functional access because sales is a shared service. But you know, I was one of the original uh, founders of Keats, so I'm pretty close with the product team. So I kind of had a leg up, if you will, on being able to have access, you know, cross-functionally. But yeah, I have to tell you, Al. Uh, it wasn't that this was actually pretty pretty self self like um I don't I, I don't know the word I'm looking for the self service of this was pretty straightforward um there there were some you know we, we kind of were hoping <laughs> if we did this right we wouldn't have to have any like individual uh, questions you know that was definitely a pipe dream but it was it was a lot better than than you may have thought that um, explaining what Coda was or anything like that we really didn't do that at all with the sales team we just sent a link we said read through all this and if you have any questions you know we'll set up a meeting probably not the best model to roll out if we were when we're actually like rolling it out but for just you know kind of a education if you will maybe it's a little bit of a little bit of a different game gotcha and i mean i guess more from a business perspective do you guys still, I remember when I first messaged you about this, it was like kind of a crazy yeah. time. Um, now that's been like a week or so, do you still see a lot of demand for this product or has the pocket changed at all? Yeah, uh, it's, it's still going strong actually. Um, in fact, um, we were just looking today, we're actually up about 83% on our lead generation, which is pretty, pretty wild. So, um, so yeah, there's definitely still a demand. Uh, now, admittedly, a, a lot of that sometimes is just people trying to figure out how to actually do like telehealth virtual visits, which isn't something that uh, that that we do like out of the box. But hey, it's at least good that we're able to answer people's questions about giving them advice to even if it's just the best of breed vendor that we can um, refer them to. Cool. Um, one question I had on the very at, right when you first started was your the there was that Google Doc that was like spun yeah. up really randomly and just like yeah. just kind of like a brain dump. Yeah, I'm curious if you had not used Coda, like what tools you might have considered, or maybe other people on the team might have used in response to that Google Doc. Yeah, what 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 would have happened is um, probably. Um, Probably a lot of it would have just kind of happened within the Google Doc itself. Yeah, you know that that the, there would have been some headers and maybe some some questions on it. Uh, a lot of it would just kind of uh, you know happen um, synchronously through um, through Slack, and uh, and then there would just be a trust which e with each department that uh, you know whatever announcement came out uh, that that you read it and that that you got it through. So I, I don't think it would have, it, it definitely wouldn't have changed much. Um, I, I don't think it would have changed necessarily the end product, but it would have impacted the efficiency by which we were able to generate transparency to, to everybody. And certainly um, if we didn't use this for the, for the sales team, um, it would have happened uh, basically through just like probably a long announcement you know, maybe a Slack post or a, even an email and um, maybe a PowerPoint or something like that. It's kind of like historically how things um, worked at Clinician and operations and, and product that they, they would have kept using, you know, Pivotal Tracker and, and Rike to, to bring those things, those things forward. Cross-functionally, it would have been a little bit more 
um, every man for himself, if you will, or, or just kind of working off of the Google Doc and maybe a loose leaf Google Sheet. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. So it would have worked, but probably, probably not as um, not as centralized, if you will. Yeah, strung together by a bunch of different platforms. Yeah, which is usually the case when these kind yeah. of things happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, you definitely. I mean, so the publishing a doc is a relatively new feature. Yeah. Um, like you're actually utilizing a whole bunch of new features that just came out in the last, I would say three, four weeks. Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to ask about was on the on the section, the pages list on the left-hand side, how you chose to hide certain folders and sections there. Like lead flow, I believe is hidden. Is it oh yeah. So so basically what we what we hid and we actually hid this too um, was we just wanted to make uh, everything so that um, because this ended up only being a, a pub when we published it, it was for the revenue team, the sales team. And so we wanted to take out everything of the iterative and creative process and just make it straightforward what the end product was. So that's how we decided to hide those um, those certain features or those certain folders and sections. One of the wrestlings that I had, uh, Al, or that we had was, do we, do we take these and make it actually a separate doc? Because when we when we launched this, it wasn't perfect. So we were still interacting with like the action item section and with the lead flow section. Um, the editors were just doing it with the section staying hidden, so that mm. um, so that they could still interact with the public doc. Now that worked really great, except um, I had to do a, a a decent amount of internal explaining of how you that one sections could be hidden and how you view them. Because uh, I, I can't recall, but I, I think that there were often times where, where people would come in like this, and they they yep. wouldn't know right that there were hidden sections. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, but once people got this part down, then people really liked it because it was just on um, just on one doc. Same thing with locking and you know unlocking. Like if we if we were wanting to edit some stuff, it would be nice to lock it uh, so that. It wouldn't be messed up by by the by the sales team that was reading it, but we could also go like quickly and update it at night and not have to maybe do a duplicate effort because we know it would be reflected, um, you know, reflected back towards them. Mm -hmm. Right. This the 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 second uh, thing on the on the hidden thing was, uh, this was also tough, um, not 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 tough, but it took a little while to kind of explain explain the difference between this because um, when when uh like I had a colleague of mine that made this one that was the link in the marketing template just for people to see what it was. Well, and this so, is technically not the published URL, right? This is like there's because. Well, it is. It is published. Uh, let me. Uh, that's, oh, that's I just see. the internal view of it. But I see. Uh, yeah, there is a. Um, like a nice URL kind of format. Oh, there yeah, is a Taylor. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. But um. What uh, uh, Taylor is has, has has edited a lot of docs, but not not made a lot of docs. So mm -hmm. when when she uh, published this, you know, she just she was familiar with with this. So she thought, well, if I do anyone with a link and I do can view, then um, you know they'll be able to see like the buttons and the check marks and and stuff like that. And um, and so it was a little. I had to kind of explain to her, no, when you're going to make this actually public facing, we'll publish it, even though the setting is um, a similar. But again, once people got it, then it was good. But those were two things we had to do a little bit of um, product coaching on to try to make sure people understood. Yeah, that's what I'm always worried about, especially like when you have a 18 hour sprint, it's like you want to roll out the tool, but then to have to explain it, it might, that's always a stumbling block. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if it would have been a brand new tool that no one had any type of like, we were like, you know, what the heck is is this thing? I, you know, I think it definitely played in our favor that people, they've known about it and they've seen it, even though they they haven't necessarily used it because there was some type of familiarity with it. Right. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I know I've been asking a lot of questions, but um, if anyone else has questions, feel free to leave in the chat. Um, 
there's nothing else. I'm gonna open it up to those of you who are still here. If anyone wants to present, actually, I think a friend of mine, he's um, a Brendan who's in the, the meetup, I think he wanted to present. Um, I'm just gonna see if he's in the chat. Uh, yeah, but you know, I think, like I said, a lot of people, including myself, have been building a lot of docs to deal with um, the, the crisis and just working from home. So, uh, okay, Brendan's saying one second. Um, Brendan, just chat. <laughs> this is like, unlike a real meetup, I can't just like talk to the person. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. Like, I'm like, uh, Brendan, if you're hearing this, just go in the chat. Let me know when you're ready to come on screen. <laughs> um, but in the meantime, I guess, uh, how are how are you doing, David, in terms of coping with working from home and all that stuff? Well, probably similar to everyone. I mean, I'm getting weirder by the day uh, in terms of how we <laughs> entertain, entertain ourselves and what my wife and I do for uh, entertainment and randomly getting into, you know, composting and all sorts of stuff that happens when you're, when you're stuck at home in terms of moving work forward remotely. Uh, for me personally, it hasn't been a, a huge change because uh, I'm, I worked pretty distributed for the last uh, year or so. And yep. basically have basically have lived on the road um, for, for the rest of our team. I think it's been a, a bigger challenge um, for um, some of our like product team that, or the clinicians product team. But overall, it's been pretty good, and I think uh, it's also kind of nice to have a have a pretty simple uh, options of what you can do each day. It's been been a good reminder, at least for me, to you know sit on the porch and read a book or uh, or stuff like that because I don't have you know not going to happy hour or something. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Yep, the number of virtual happy hours I've attended has gone up quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go ahead and invite Brendan to on screen. Uh, yeah, I'm still getting used to this platform. I've also typically just have joined Crowdcast as an as attendee, but it's my first time hosting, yeah. so yeah. it's a little new experience for me. <clears throat> Yeah. Brendan, hey. Yeah, I'm just gonna do one thing. I think I'm gonna switch the cameras that it's using. That's possible. Okay. I'm not sure why it chose that. There we go. Oh. Nope. Oh. Nope. nope. Hey. Well. <laughs> no. Hey, do you want to introduce yourself really quick to yeah. the audience? Yes, absolutely. Um, hi guys, I'm uh, I'm Brendan Weinstein. Uh, I'm from New York. Um, along with Al, we uh, together met and we were um, putting together a no code New York City um, meetup group. We uh, collaborate with another uh, partner of ours, Eric, um, who works with Bubble. So we have a nice little you know, growing community. I'm sure I've met and seen some of you maybe in attendance there. Um, I'm actually pretty excited about this. Uh, I, in most of the no code and or um, I would say low code development um, products or presentations I've been given, it's never been about Coda and about how I use a document, right? It's been about like how to shortcut and circumnavigate the in inabilities of my team uh, in a web development sense, right? So like, we need to get a cheap web app built, like let's go no code. Or we need, we don't have engineers, we have great designers, we're willing to spend the time, we're gonna build something in Webflow and you know a lot of data. Coda to me allowed, was completely different in that sense. Coda to me was a way for me to be able to organize and be a product manager that I am. So my passion, background and uh, experience lies mostly from uh, a very young kid, fascinated by computers. Um, I let that led into education technology. I was, you know, starting a found, uh, founding a startup and wanted to help fix the education system, bringing it online, relevant skill assessments. Um, 
collaboration was not there yet, right? The ability to actually collaborate online with other students and build together, none of that was there. Um, as this grew on, my product management experience was, I would say, 10 times enhanced and 10 times uh, more effective by going through a, a program called Product School. In Product School, they helped us understand what a lot of these frameworks that you may see, like in coded templates or how some other people are using coded docs. And my whole revelation was that it's not necessarily the, the product or, or the, you know, the no code and the uh, movement, the product that you're given with pre-built templates, it's seeing how someone else is able to construct their ideas, thoughts, um, their presentation in, in a tool and a product that makes it intuitive for both the end user and the person building it. Right. We all know as, or I don't know if how many of you guys are product managers or, or product, um, you know, professionals in, in some sense at all, but there's a lot of documentation. There's a lot of road mapping, right? There's, there's collaborate collaboration that needs to be done. There's, a large set of reasons to need interactive and um, informative document documents. So for me, I uh, I've used Coda for for several years, but not for a full purpose. Like this was going to be my tool to do all of my product roadmaps or a tool to do all of my um, meeting minutes. Uh, I found it to be way more of a tool that I went went to for resources of the templates to learn a little bit about how some of the people such as Al were actually constructing their temp their templates to build, um, you know what I mean? Productive wor workflow habits to build productive, um, operations within a company. Um, the ability to, to have everyone shared on visit that, you know, corporate visibility, everyone is, is transparent when people are able to, view the document that that may be in question or maybe not edit it, but certainly view any relevant information. That to me was where I felt no code had a stronger value to majority of organizations and business than the no code, um, you know, uh, platforms we hear and see and speak of all, you know, so often I find those to be very much so for application building and for front end and, and user at, uh, interaction. So for me, I think that my favorite coder doc I'd like to show you guys is, um, actually not one I fully built to be honest. I've worked and tweaked through it. It's my go-to guide now for trying who, for understanding when building, launching, creating products, how to find that fit, right? How, how to use a, a, a engine almost, right? A growth engine, a, a, a exact product market fit engine that can be done and managed through a document, right? Word was never going to do that. Excel was never going to build me an exact model, right? So I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Rahul Vara from superhuman, but he, uh, he actually has constructed what I think we can say is now the globally accepted definition of product market fit. And here's a document that he actually, um, share my screen momentarily. This is a document he has built in Coda, walking you through the exact, how do I share this screen? There it is with the exact steps and model for your product market fit. Can everyone see my screen now? Yep, maybe just zoom in a little bit. Yep. On yep. the, or actually you're, yep, there you go. Yep. And that should be good, right? Yep. Great. So. Just zoom in a little bit, it's a little hard to see. Wanna Command plus on your, yeah. Let me just shrink that a little bit so I can see that over there. Perfect. How's that? 
a little bit, Luke, want me to zoom in a little bit more? Uh, that's good. We can go from there. Great. So, yeah, this, this is perfect. Here we go. So, Superhuman Product Market Fit Engine, this is the page that I had gotten to and stumbled upon at first when I had seen a coded doc about my basically product road model, uh, uh, role model in Rahul, the way he envisions conceptualizes products to me was one of the um, most mind boggling and, and yet simplistic views I had ever understood. The most deeply thought out yet right on the top surface for anyone else to understand the communication that he has allows for you to feel me the end user not overwhelmed by what this product market fit may seem like it's going to feel it's going to be like so this document is basically like what is the wiki right this is the guide the overview of exactly what's going to go in step by step to build your product market fit. Um, the reason why I use product market fit as my example doc is I think the no code movement allows for the most effective, um, rapid, like, you know, build to an MVP, find that product market fit, validate your ideas without, you know, the massive tech that you could build and, and extensive time developer resources. So, Seeing him put this together in a no code tool itself, that, that was just perfect for me. Um, so at Superhuman, we turn this is this company, we turn their process into a five step engine. So here you see step one, just clicking here onto this link, right? And you should see you choose these six questions are the ones that he has laid out. Choose the questions though in your survey you don't necessarily want to be asking, um, you know, the, a, a boilerplate set of user feedback questions. Do you, do you think every user, you know what I mean, is going to feel the same way or be interested in the same type of, um, you know, engagement right away with, with the founder seeking feedback on their product? No. I mean, they all have differing opinions and they all, some are angry, some hate it, and some don't really want to spend the time sharing feedback with you. So here's the way that Rahul had explained it to me. And in this document, I believe it does a pretty good job of explaining that in a general term as well. How would you, the, the six questions that were asked were summarized up by the top one being by far the most important question Rahul said that this entire operation led down to. And he did not explain why he started with it. It just happened to be that that's where they ended as well as started. And that is, how would you feel if you could no longer use X, whatever your product is, when, when seeking feedback and trying to find your product market fit, right? We're, we're asking how badly do you need this? How upset would you be if you couldn't have it? And if that is what's driving you, it's probably even more disruptive to you to lose this product than it is to lose a product that may just cost you a lot of money to replace, right? So the, the way that you, one could follow this document through is two through six should basically be in the survey regarding your product, right? How would your ben users benefit? How can you improve your communication app, whatever it may be, but the same pro, uh, principles and processes, the same, uh, you like workflow is basically, you know, copyable or not copyable. I would say it's basically maneuverable throughout different industries and definitely able to be, um, replicated over and over again for various different types of businesses or product launches. Um, in my, at least in my experience. So for, um, for the survey part type form, um, Google forms doesn't really, really matter. Um, as long as you can actually compile in the data of those six questions, it should be good. Um, here's where 
the instructions for the type form are. If you actually want to follow this doc, I'll be sharing it along. You can use these tabs to get direct instructions right here on how to um, set up these survey questions. So upon receiving this, uh, the responses of those six survey questions, this is what he had received back. Okay. Didn't that. This is stating, obviously, as we could see, several things, but it's it's running everyone through every user, every survey, and it's going to build a matrix matrix of 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 a, of a sort. It's going to allow him to understand where are users finding their most delightful and and um, high high impact moments and where are they kind of giving negative feedback in an area that's something they're not even focused on to begin with. Right. So the somewhat, dis the, um, very disappointed, the somewhat disappointed and then very disappointed, right. That's an answer that he was looking for at that same question. Number one, right. How would you feel if you can no longer use it? That to him and their team is, the reason you're going to come back is if you were devastated, if you can no longer use it, that's the strongest user you have, right? You, you're an entirely um, a product and you're fit for the market that that user is, is, is definitely looking for. Um, I'm not really going to go deeper into, you know, what exactly the survey responses um, came out, like the details of how, these responses led to the next um, like data points, but I will touch on the fact that when we got down to, I think, what was it? The 500th response. Yes. Okay. The 500th response was not the amount total that was surveyed. This was the amount that was determined based upon a, a, like, like a segmentation of amount of user of users that were surveyed that answered incomplete um right answered completely and then those who were not actually relevant because although they seemed like their position would have been the way that they use email and the way that email interacts with their everyday life was not quite the audience that would ever understand why this product was being built just yet so there was a little bit of cleansing of, of data, but these 500 were how the, I mean, the next steps and the product market fit engine was going to be built. Hey, so Bernard, I want to be, that's like, I want to be, like I said, the, pers the user persona, right. Is going to be the, are they a founder, um, a manager, executive, what are they at their company? Right. It, it's for, everyone to love and everyone to gain the same value out of right but without these user personas and ensuring you're prov you're providing a value and an experience for each of these different types of users that is not going to be met with anger on the on the you know end user that's just a simple email client you not so overwhelmed not so concerned with email user comparatively to the business user receiving 200,000 emails a week and is completely lost. Right? Hey, Brendan, I just want to be yeah. conscious of time. Um, you want to kind of get to the yeah, point yeah, the, of the, like the how you use this? Yeah. Yeah, sure. This is basically the most important part. And then the, the roadmap is not, is not so much as relevant to this piece. So I only have two, two pieces left anyway. Okay. Um, so sure. So assigning a persona would be simple, right? You just go through, and whatever your set of job title is, 